Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Well, praise the Lord. Wednesday nighters. I'm excited about the series that we're going to be going into on the Holy Spirit because I think the Holy Spirit warrants a series. There's so much to His nature and things that we need to know about Him as a church, as the body of Christ, that it takes a series to get most of the stuff out that we need to know. I'm thoroughly convinced that the denominationalism and the division that's in the body of Christ throughout the nation and the world usually breaks down to how someone feels about the ministry, the operation, and the timing of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. We agree probably most on all the other issues. It's just the Holy Spirit issues that usually that we grapple with with one another. So, you know, the Bible says that in the last days, which I believe we're in, uh, you know, God's going to unify his church. And it says that he's going to cause the knowledge of the glory of God which is the Holy Spirit, to cover the earth the way the seas cover the earth. That's a lot of knowledge, right? So let's see if we can get some of it out right now. Praise the Lord. So I was meditating a little bit on what I should share, and I believe the Lord led me to talk about the value of your testimony a little bit and how that connects you to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And uh, my experience is I pray, I get whatever I get that is the strongest is what I record and write down. But you never are 100% sure that, are you sure, Lord, that's where you want to go? And you're just praying and hoping. But I love it when you come into an environment. And I've had three conversations with people even before, from the time I came into the building to the time I came up here, about people telling me about something that's going on that fits perfectly to the message that I want to share. The testimony, I don't know if this was orchestrated or if it's just a Holy Spirit thing, but the song about Jesus taking away our fear and even the testimony of the, of the drummer was so synchronized that I just have to feel that the Holy Spirit has a thread that's running through everything that we're doing tonight. And I love that as a confirmation or an affirmation. It encourages you that you've heard from God. Doing that consistently over and over again where you're not sure and then God confirms is one of the ways that we establish confidence with our relationship with the Holy Spirit. We don't just wake up one day and pray and it's like the Holy Spirit's right there just having this heavy dialogue and you just feel like you've known him forever. It's stepping forward little by little, testing the water and finding that I really can walk on water here. And over and over and over again until you recognize the subtleties of the Holy Spirit and develop a confidence there. I want to start with John 14, 26, but I, I asked if we could get it in the Amplified. I don't know if we were able to do that. We did. Okay, I'm going to read it from my Amplified here just in case there's a a difference, Uh, 1426, it says, but the comforter, now if I have King James, I like old King James, and it says comforter, but you know what, when I was studying on the Holy Spirit, and I just read comforter, I thought, gee, that's great, if I ever need comfort, he's going to be there, but if you look that word up, comforter, in the Greek, you find out that it has all kinds of applications to be strengthened, it means He's your counselor, your comforter, your helper, your intercessor, your advocate, your strengthener, and your standby. All of those elements are included in the Greek word that King James simply translates comforter. And I thought, boy, what a little hidden piece of gold and a bunch of dirt there because I could have never gotten all of that just from... So we walk around getting beat to death by the enemy... And then we just seek the comforter to rub our fevered brow, right? But no, he's the strengthener. He's the standby. He's the one that comes alongside to assist. He's the one that groans through you with groanings that can't be uttered in a natural tongue. He's the intercessor, the one that prays the perfect prayer through you, for you, and for those you love. And for people you don't even know. There's a missionary in India right now that's crying out because he's been put in jail for preaching the gospel. 
and he's lost contact with all of his people and nobody knows the condition that he's in. But you're groaning at four in the morning for somebody you don't even know about for him to be delivered from that situation, right? So, you know, God help us if we, if we don't pray in the Holy Ghost, right? Now, you correct me with this, but this is one of my favorite stories that I've leaned on a long time. And I heard it a long time ago from you. So if I mess it up, you got to come up and correct it. But the way I remember it is that you were dinking around in the garage, not really being spiritual, just working on something, fixing something. And all of a sudden, you were arrested with a burden. And you, you didn't know what it was about. And you said, Lord, what is it? What is it? And you didn't know anything to do but to pray in spirit. And you prayed in the spirit until the burden lifted. And right after you finished, you got a call from your wife. And she said, you can't believe what just happened. I was going through an intersection. I had the right of way. And a semi-truck came through the intersection and almost T-boned me. But I, I, I looked up the last minute and was able to avert tragedy. You know what? How could we not want to pray in the Holy Ghost? Right? I mean, it averts tragedy in our life. He's thing, he sees things in the future that we don't even know about. And he puts a burden on us to pray. Now, how many, how many times have you woken up four in the morning and God wanted you to pray and you're just like, oh, no. <laughs> and you go, da, 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 and you roll over and fall back asleep, right? Well, I take it a little bit more serious now when I hear stories like that, you know. So the word for counselor, helper, intercessor, and so forth is paraclete, the one who comes alongside to assist. Now, he's not the initiator, Right? That means how can he assist you with something you haven't even engaged with, right? So if you step out to do something, even though it might be a little uh, scary, it might be a first time to step over a line you've never stepped before, he looks at the step and says, I'm right here to come along and to assist and to empower you to be amazing in this endeavor, right? But too many of us are on this side of the line asking the Holy Spirit to get evidence of empowerment, that never comes until we jump into the water, right? There was no way that Jesus could have proved to Peter that the water was going to sustain him until he jumped out of the boat. And then apparently some power came along to assist him there, and he didn't sink. I'm convinced it was the Holy Spirit. I had this experience uh, along, like when I was a young believer, and I was attending a church, and uh, I was relatively new to the church. There was a lot of people in the church. And they said, hey, you know, I like your spirit. Uh, I'd like for you to testify next Wednesday night. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Uh-uh. You know, because I hadn't pushed through the barrier of the fear of public speaking or being able to communicate with people. And statistically, it's been proven that people fear public speaking more than they fear death itself. And I probably fit into that category. And so, yeah, I'm like, no, yeah, no. And they come on, you know, we're supposed to live by faith. It was a word of faith church. And all they could say is, dude, we walk by faith and not by sight. So they pretty kind of corralled me. And then there was the Holy Ghost was in me that said, dude, you know, be a believer. Be strong. Go for it. Step out of the boat. So I agreed to go up there. I remember grabbing the microphone and going up. And I'd never done this before. And I walked up and I looked up at everybody looking at me. I'm like, oh, man, no. Right? I said, dude, you're going to crash and burn, and it's going to be terrible. But I opened my mouth, and I just did my best. All I could think of one sentence. <laughs> and so I kind of was going forward with the one sentence. And then all of a sudden, it was like, oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. That, mm, I'll say that. Blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, it started to flow a little bit. And then I had the weirdest experience ever. I call it an out-of-soul experience. It wasn't an out-of-body experience, but all of a sudden, and, and this really happened, I, I can't qualify it, but it, it happened. I felt like there were two minds in one body. And one of my minds was a spectator looking at the guy that was doing the talking. My soul disengaged my thought process of what do I say next and how is this going to work. It disengaged, and it was like watching me preach Things I didn't even know I knew about my testimony, and there was a flow to it. And I watched myself in amazement. And I don't say that in a proud way. It's just I recognize that ain't me. And it freaked me out a little bit. And then all of a sudden, 
they said, oh, that was great. And everybody thought it was great. And this, that, and the other. And I, I sat down. I'm like, what the heck just happened? <laughs> and I realized that when we will take a step of faith, because God won't give us that experience until we actually begin to testify, right? That the Holy Spirit will engage with our testimony and empower it. And literally, if we'll let him, he'll kind of move us back to the back and step to the front and begin to speak with a wind that affects and influences people. And I'm, I'm asking myself, what was that? Is that like the anointing or something? I mean, I didn't really know what it was. But little by little over the years, I, I've learned to trust. Even to, to this present day, when I prepare messages, I'm never 100% comfortable with what I'm going to say. But pulling the Holy Spirit into a situation by stepping out by faith to do something is really how we're empowered and how we're sanctified. The Bible says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. That's our connection. And the word of our testimony, whatever it is that we step out in faith to share with someone else, and then we love not our life unto death, which has, I'm sure, many layers of applications, but in the shallowest application, it could simply mean that you're willing to surrender your agenda for whatever direction the Holy Spirit wants to go, right? Right? The extreme, obviously, would be martyrdom for the Lord Jesus Christ. But I believe that the application for me was I prepare to such a degree that I'm secure with what I'm going to say. I have all these safety nets, like if I get out on a limb, I can always go here and this, that, and the other, and you're all freaked out, right? And then all of a sudden, you go up there, and the Lord said, no, no, I don't want you to talk about that today. I want you to talk about this. I don't have any notes for that. And he's like, exactly, right? Because that's where you step out and begin to trust that the Holy Spirit is the one that comes alongside to assist you in the testimony that he's called you to. And because the presence of the Spirit is on your testimony, the Bible says in 1 Samuel, do we have that 1 Samuel scripture? King Saul, before he was ordained to be a king, was out looking for a donkey and he runs into some prophets that tell him to go to some other prophets. And then there's a prophecy over him that says, when you connect with those prophets, you will begin to prophesy. And he comes around a corner and they're all prophesying. And because he's in the environment of prophecy, he just begins to prophesy. And the Bible says when he does that, that unction coming through him will turn him into another man. That means the prophetic unction transforms you into the image of Jesus Christ, right? The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And prophecy is words with wind. And they transform you, right? So it's not just the, the Lord that is prophetic. But every time you open your mouth to share your testimony or witness Jesus or share the gospel, you activate the Holy Spirit and what should normally would come out of your head now comes out of your spirit. And it has wind and influence and transforming power for the people that are listening. But not only them, but for you as well. It transforms you every time you share the gospel. So why does the devil want to make us fear to share our testimony and to share the gospel with others? He doesn't want us transformed, right? So what do we need to do? We need to do like this little drummer girl did. We need to say, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to do it afraid. And we step up and we cross over that line and we're like, oh, help me, Jesus. And then all of a sudden there's a wind. And we're like, whoa, what is that? You know, I've never spoke so eloquently before. I never spoke with uh, such power. I can't believe it. Somebody actually clapped in the back row, you know. <laughs> But why is that? The presence of the Holy Spirit is honoring your faith to step out and share your faith. Now, if we can impregnate the body of Christ with this revelation, then the church will start winning souls like they should be. But right now, it's like less than 10% of people actually ever lead anybody to Jesus Christ who call themselves Christians in the nation. And that's sad. But they don't understand that that's where you connect with God. That's where you connect with the Holy Spirit. That's where relationship is developed. And that's where knowledge of the Holy Spirit is developed and cultivated in your life. So I just want to encourage you to get out of the boat and step and start giving your testimony and doing it his way, not your way. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Pastor Tim. I may call you back up, so don't get too comfortable. I know it wasn't on your notes, but. You know, as uh, Pastor Tim is talking, I can't help but think about revivals. And I know that we hear this term revival um, over and over again, whether you hear it in churches or you know, you go to a conference, it's revival. And, and I love, trust me, I love big gatherings. Um, we love doing that. I do that. We, when I go out to Latin America, we'll see anywhere from 14,000 to 1 million people. So I love those gatherings. But let me be honest with you. Okay, those are beautiful. They're wonderful. And I think that, um, you know, we, we long for those type of gatherings. But you know what God longs for more than that? Because... We will come together, but what he longs for more is the revival that's going to happen only through the Holy Spirit's gifts in every single believer. There will be no greater, think about it. If you're someone who is uncomfortable to be in relationship with the Holy Spirit to walk in the gifts, whether it's words of knowledge, words of wisdom, whether it's prophecy, whether it's gifts of faith, gifts of healing, Think about this. If you are someone who is not comfortable doing any of that or even making yourself available for God to work the Holy Spirit in you and through you, just imagine if you were to give God the permission to say, okay, I'm done with trying to figure this all out because obviously it's never going to make natural sense because God's not natural. He's super, and then he jumps on my natural, and I become supernatural with so the truest revival is when you step out of your comfort into the spirit, now there's revival. But, but why do I say this? Because here's, here's what most Christians have done with Holy Spirit. We have made him a teaching or we have institutionalized him but have never gotten to the place of knowing him intimately personally at that level and so when we hear messages of the holy spirit it's almost like man the holy spirit's so far away i can't reach him when the truth and the reality is that no he's so close that he lives inside you and so if we're going to see revival it's going to happen through people it's going to happen through you and i not another gathering, okay? Gatherings are awesome once again. But you are the majority when you're outside these four walls. You're the majority. You have God. God is for you. God's not against you. God is with you. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And so if we're going to begin to see our, our community, our, our family, our, our country completely change and transform, you better step up and step in. You have to. You must. It's not an up. You can't keep reading your Bible and hearing about the Holy Spirit. And then there's nothing that's active inside of you that says that the Holy Spirit is not only living in you, but that God has permission to, to do something through you as well. I, that's my prayer. My prayer is that Elevate Church would be filled with not just mature people that know the word, but People that are not afraid to just step out and just go for it. But what if I'm wrong? But what if you're not? But what if I miss it? Well, you will. But what if I make a mistake? You'll make plenty. But what if I say the wrong thing? You will. So it's just giving yourself permission to say, man, I'm really screwed up. <laughs> That's why I need the Holy Spirit. Because he makes up for screw up. He makes up for mistakes. He's just, he's just wondering, man, is there, is, there, is there a nice hot soul in the house for, that I can move through so that we can do some amazing things, right? That's, that's, that's what God wants with us. And so the problem is that we have too much knowledge. We have too much information. You can bust out all your scriptures, but God doesn't want us to just be quoting scripture. God wants us to be the scripture. Free latte for that one person. <laughs> Wherever you are, Lord, just 
Speak to he or she tonight, Lord. Bless them. That, so we, I think we've institutionalized our own selves. And we're waiting for God. God, you do it. I love Pastor Tim said, well, you know what? We are the initiators, not God. God says, where, where, where I'm invited, I show up. So ask yourself this question. When was the last time you've invited the Holy Spirit in your life to do life with you? When was the last time you intentionally, not, I, no, no, notice I didn't say when was the last time you thought about the Holy Spirit. No, when was the last time that you intentionally roll, you roll with the Holy Spirit. I mean, we roll together. We, you know, we're road dogs. He ain't your wingman. You're his wingman. I got my wingman with you. No, <laughs> you're the wingman or the woman. And, and so um, the difference between the first century Christians and us is that they walked in power. We don't. That's the difference. They walk in power. And when you look at our society today, though America is, is recognized as a Christian nation, do you realize that in the next 10 years, China will have more Christians than the United States of America? China is having revival. And you know where it started? And it's a communist country, right? Guess where it started? Underground. With one page of the Bible. You got a whole book. Tell me how that's working for you. These people, one page and the Holy Ghost. And then they, they would get Bibles and be like, oh my God, I already knew that. I knew. Why? See, it's not a matter of Am I qualified? It's a matter of how hungry are you? Are you hungry for the Spirit of God? Are you hungry to get a word from heaven for people? Not for you. For people. Are you hungry to hear from heaven to give you an assignment that's going to make you so uncomfortable, but it's going to bring so much life to someone else because you were available and willing and ready to do whatever it was he was ready to ask you for. When was the last time that he asked you to do something so scary and so out of your comfort that you obeyed him, and because of that obedience, you saw this great, amazing fruit, and lives were changed. China is seeing great revival right now because they, have, they had to learn how to trust and, and know and have intimacy with the Holy Spirit because beyond one page, and that's, and that's only if you were lucky if you had a page of the Bible. Go on YouTube, type in China Bibles. There's so many videos where people have snuck in Bibles, and the moment they open the, brief, the briefcase or the suitcase, people jump like it's a piñata that just got broken with candy. It's funny. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. And I'm thinking so many of us have like four or five Bibles in our own house, on our phone. And so let's look at this real quick. Acts chapter 17, verse 6. Did I offend anyone? Okay, good. Look at this. Now, let me give you the context of Acts chapter 17. These people were giving testimony like Pastor Tim was saying. They were testifying of what God did in their life. And they're preaching it on the highways, the byways. They're preaching it in the synagogues. They're anywhere they can get opportunity, man. They were just testifying, and God did this, and God did that, and God did this, and God did that. And they're just so on fire. They wanted everyone to know how alive God was. Jesus was not dead to them. Jesus was more alive than he was when he was walking on the earth with them. And they're testifying about this. And the people or the Jews... Uh, got so jealous about it. They were so ticked off because they were seeing that lives were being changed. I mean, even some of their own that never believed in Christ's coming were becoming born-again believers. Man, why? Was it because of the sermons? No. Let me tell you something. Most of it was not because of their messages. Most of the transformations were because the disciples were walking in this Holy Ghost power. And then they were being converted. And in Acts chapter 17, verse 6, it says, but now this is the whole context of what I was sharing. 
But when they did not find him, so they were looking for Paul and Silas who were preaching in the synagogue. It says they dragged Jason. What did Jason have to do with all this? They were looking for Paul and Silas. You see, it, it had nothing to do with Paul or Silas, but it had everything to do with anyone who was in relationship with the Holy Spirit. If you're not having conflict, you're not in relation with the Holy Ghost. So they go out and they're like, let's grab Jason. Any Jasons in the house tonight? <laughs> and some other believers before the city officials shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the city. You guys reading with me? Y'all even here? Are you guys awake? <laughs> all asleep already, man? Okay. These men who have caused trouble all over the what? Yeah. All over the what? Do you see how the Holy Spirit, he's not, he's not subject to a city. Man, he is subject to the whole world. They said, man, they've caused trouble all over the world and have now come here. The original translation says this. These men have turned the world upside down. How would you like to turn your job, your workplace, your community upside down? Let me, tell you, let me tell you something real quick. Because if you become intentional about having this intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit, for and I'll tell you how to do that. But if you become intentional with, with really allowing God to use you, with really allowing God to, to interrupt your life. Because so many of us were so busy with life that the Holy Spirit is just standing by. That's why it's called the standby. <laughs> can, I, can I get a word? It's true. He just read it, right? He's standby. Wonderful counselor. Standby. Helper. So he just stands by like, okay, I wonder if I can get on this one. And so he's just standing by wondering if he can get permission to interrupt whatever you're doing. Now check this out. Here's how he works. So I remember going on Facebook. That's why I love social media. You got to love it and hate it. You love it because, you know what, you like to look at all your likes, right? You post your picture and you just want all your likes. You, you just want to feel like you're loved. Let's be honest. And then if you don't get enough likes, you take it down. <laughs> just being honest. But, but here's, here's the reality. God is moving through social media. See, God, God is moving anywhere and everywhere that you set your eyes to. And so... Um, a couple of years ago, I was on social media, and I saw a, a horrific story of, uh, of, a, of a woman's picture who was in a severe coma and who had been in this coma for, for, for weeks now. And I remember scrolling through the social media, and, and I'm just minding my own business. You know, you just, you know how you do. You scroll, right? Whatever, whatever. That's how most of us live, whatever, 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 right? And as we walk by people. But I remember be, feeling impressed in my heart where God said, stop. Send a message. He didn't tell me all like that, but I just, I, I felt that way. Like send a message. I didn't know these people. Send a message and just reach out to them. And I, so I started with that. I sent a message to this family that I did not know. I just saw the image of the girl being in a coma, and it looked pretty horrible. Uh, head cracked open. You know, it was just ugly. It was horrible. It was very painful. And I said, hey, uh, I'm a local pastor in Santa Clarita, and um, I just wanted to reach out to you guys and see if I can come and visit and pray for your daughter. And long behold, when it's the Holy Spirit, he sets you up. And they said, sure. I'm like, oh, wow. Now what? And, and the Lord said, no, seriously. And I'm like, okay, this is getting scary now because their daughter's in a coma. And I grabbed one of my friends who's a worship leader. I said, grab your guitar. He was staying with me. He was from Mexico, and he's a great worship leader. I said, grab your guitar. You're going with me. We're like, where are we going? Like, we're going to go pray for this woman who's, like, dead, uh, but in this coma, whatever. And he's like, what? He's like, all right, let's do this. And so we go. We drive there. And as I sat there, the doctor had just finished talking with mom and daughter. And he walked out. Then I came. I said, hey, how you doing? Uh, my name is Mauricio. I'm the one that reached out to you. And they said, oh, thank you so much. But, but thank you. It's okay. The doctor told us that, uh, that we have a decision to make now pulling the plug for my daughter. 
She's brain dead. And this is why you have to know the Holy Spirit. This is why it's so uncomfortable. This is why revival will happen when you get out of the way. The reason we don't, st we don't step forward is because, once, ag once again, we're afraid to make mistakes. We're afraid to look stupid. We're afraid to look like those goofy Jesus freaks. Just imagine what you'll look like in heaven when you did nothing for the kingdom. Okay, we'll leave that right there. But anyways, <laughs> we'll just put a little mark pause on that one. I'm telling you, what are you going to tell God when he tells you, what did you do with the life I gave you? What are you going to tell him? Oh, well, I got a nice car and a nice house and a good job. He's going to be like, that's what I gave you, but what would you do for me? Okay, we'll leave that for Sunday. <laughs> so, then I, so, then, so then I clearly, I, I was impressed and I, and, I, and, I, and I felt like God wanted me to tell them, to tell the doctor that they're not going to unplug her because their daughter's going to live and not die. And, and that's hard being in a situation like that. Because you're just, you're, you're giving them in the flesh and the natural false hope. How dare you give them? What, what kind of pastor are you to come here? I just sat with them. I'm the professional. Aren't you glad that doctors are practicing medicine while God is the great physician? Amen. <laughs> but that's on you now. You either believe that or you don't. Now you can, you know, you want to get your plug pulled, go ahead. But, but, God is in, God, but God wants to do great miracles. Amen? And, and, so, and so I said, listen, uh, your daughter's not going to die. She's going to live. And the mom just started sharing. And I'm like, I'm telling you, God is gonna, God's going to bring your daughter back. And I said, can I please see her? And they said, okay. Mind you, they have not let anyone in. And now you have me and my friend coming in with a guitar in intensive care. You're not allowed to come in with a guitar. We made it past everybody with the guitar, and all we did, I wish I could tell you, I went there and I just like, in the name of Jesus, rise, <laughs> rise. I walked in there so freaked out, like, God, let me be honest with you. I walked in there with belief and unbelief. I hate it when people are like, oh, I praise God, I shut up. <laughs> no, you didn't, shut up. You act like you're Superman. No, you're human. I walked in there with the fear of God, but also with the fear of man. The fear of God was show up. The fear of man is what if this doesn't work? And that's how I felt. But aren't you glad that God loves a person who's willing to be vulnerable for his holy purposes? That God is not looking for perfection. God is not looking for someone adequate in their communication or, 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 or in their pedigree where you come from. God can care. Let, let me tell you something. Man, if you came from royal, you know, bloodline to God, that's nothing. You want to know royal bloodline? It's the blood of Jesus. That makes you royal. That's your royal bloodline, the blood of Jesus. And so, are you all bored yet? Okay, let me keep going. So we, we were there, and, and, uh, and all we did, I was nervous, I was afraid, but I also had faith. I'm like, Lord, no, you, you didn't bring me here for this, for just nothing. And so what I do, I went there, I prayed for her, I, I, I asked God to deliver her, raise her up. I did everything I knew how to do, and I quoted a lot of scriptures. That's all I remember doing, a lot of that. And then we just sang for like, I forgot how many hours. Five hours? I forgot how many hours. I have it on a video. And, uh, and the, hey, the mother testified. This, we have a whole video of this whole story. Okay, so if y'all don't think I'm telling the truth, the mom said everything we did, what I'm telling you. Because I know sometimes we can be hype as preachers. And so, <laughs> just being honest too. <laughs> anyway, so, so we sang and sang and sang. And long and behold, guess what happened? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing happened. So you know what we did? We finished singing and we said, hey, you know what? We love you. God bless you. And we know that God's doing something. Mind you, she told the doctor that she was not going to pull the plug. The, now, she had already been weeks in a coma. She had had zero brain activity. Zero. And no 
body reflex. Zero. The next day, I get a phone call from the mom. You're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. You're not Because the doctor was already ready, said, no, we're pulling. We can't. Putting the pressure on. She had a gag reflex. And guess what happened next? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing happened from there. You know what happened? That was enough. That was enough for her to come back to the doctor and says, okay, so tell me, you said my daughter's brain dead. Can a brain dead person have a gag reflex? Well, no. Then we're keeping her. Do you see how you can just be one word from heaven away from someone's healing and breakthrough? But because you can be so caught up in your persona, in your own reputation, that you never do nothing for God. Because you're too concerned what everybody else thinks instead of caring about what God thinks about the situation. And of course, I stood, then I did, and then it went worse. Then I came up on stage and I said, here's what, I told the church what happened to be praying for Anais. And I said, here's what's going to happen, church. I said, Anais, I think it was like in the summertime when she went through this. And I said, come, come Christmas. She'll be standing on this stage and she will be testifying to God. And I was like, ha, ha. And I got off like, oh, Lord, you better do this, God. <laughs> you better do this, God. Because the pressure's not on me. The pressure's on who? Who told me to go there to begin with? So either he's God and he knows what he's talking about or he's not. And, and, and listen, and sure enough, we had her here standing on Christmas, alive, awake, and testifying and sharing her story of how God delivered her. And even after she came back, the doctor said she'll never walk, she'll never speak, she'll never have movement, she'll never have, well, guess what? She has them all. She texts me. I still, I'm horrible. I have not got back to her. I, I, get, I did get back to her. I texted her back, yes. But she just, you know, her dream when she stood up here, she said, my dream is to open my own salon because she's a stylist and all that, like does everything. And, uh, and she said, uh, my dream, she stood it from a bit. And I said, you know what, you're going to have that dream come, come. Mind you, she still had some physical stuff. Because, you know, what? after being in, in, in a coma, she had to learn how to walk, talk, eat, every, you name it. And weeks ago, she texted me and said, Pastor Marisha, I want you to come and check out my salon. I opened it. <laughs> and it all started, and it all started because I was on Facebook. The Holy Spirit hangs out on Facebook too, guys. It's true. He hangs out. But he's waiting for someone who is available. And that could be you right now for something that someone needs. Do you, say, do you see why it's, but you know what happens with Christians in America? We just come, we sit, we hear messages, we leave and nothing changes. How sad is that? While people like Anais, I wonder how, I, I think this a lot. I wonder how many Anaises could have had the same type of miracle or breakthrough, but a Christian was too afraid to pray because they cared more about their own reputation than to represent the one who can come and raise the dead. That's not to condemn you, but hopefully it's to convict you to say, you know what, who am I living for? Me? Or am I really living for him? Yeah, but you're a pastor. No, I don't give a rip. I've been doing this before I was a pastor. Before I was a pastor, I've been doing things like this. That's just one testimony of so many that I, I can tell you story after story. of. Man, I remember this one doctor yelled at me at another situation. Like literally said, you're going to get the hell out of here. And I looked at him and said, no, I'm not. <laughs> and, and, it was, and it was an Indian doctor who, stud, who studied Hindu. And same thing, someone needed a miracle. I was like, hell no, I'm not leaving. He said, you, you, you can't be here, you have no right. I'm like, bro, this is America. <laughs> I can be anywhere I want. <laughs> One, because I'll let the old man out, get unsaved, and show you <laughs> how I could, and then receive Christ again, <laughs> get saved, be forgiven. No, I said to him, here's the deal, man. Uh, the family wants me here, and that's, that's, 
us more than enough. God wants to ignite the gifts of the Holy Spirit in you again. Maybe you got cold like all of us have. I've gotten cold. I've gotten in that place where I just felt like, man, what's, what's going on, Mauricio? You see, when you look at the scriptures, the scriptures validate what God is saying to you tonight. And let me validate this with a verse. John chapter 16, verse 13. Everyone look on the screens, please. Here's what the, and I know we've read this verse a million times, but I want you to read it in the context of what I'm saying. He says, but when he, ever say he. Who's he? The spirit. The spirit of who? The spirit of what? The spirit of who? When he what? Comes. He will what? He will guide you into all what? He will not speak on his what? He will speak only what? And he will tell you what is yet to come. He said, Mauricio, Anais will come to life. The Holy Spirit leads you into all truth. Think about it. But what if it doesn't happen? Well, let me ask you this. Do you think it's true that God wants, God wants you healed? Do you think that's true? Do you think God wants your family healed? Do you think God wants your wife to be healed completely? Is that true or is that a lie? So then why do we fight lies and just start learning how to accept the truth? When you learn how to accept the truth is when you learn how to accept the Holy Spirit who guides you into all truth. Until then, you'll be misled with lies. He guides you into all truth. And he tells you of what is yet to come. So isn't that cool that God wants to show you what's yet to come? Close your eyes. Close your eyes for a minute. God, just ask him, Holy Spirit, show me what's yet to come. Maybe it's regarding your health. Maybe it's regarding your finances. Maybe it's regarding your family. Maybe it's regarding your, your business. Maybe it's regarding just you as a follower. Can you see yourself being bold? Come on. I, let's just do that. I want you to see yourself being bold bold for Jesus. I want you seeing yourself sharing your faith with your loved ones, with your co-workers. Come on, see yourself right now looking at them. Come on, the, the Holy Spirit wants to lead you into all truth. He wants to show you. Go ahead, let him show you real quick. Come on. See yourself telling someone how God delivered you. See yourself. See it in your mind, in your heart. Go ahead. Go, go, go. See yourself. Please. If, you, if, you're, if you're rebelling against that, shame on you. Don't rebel against God. See yourself sharing your faith with your daughter, your son, who's already grown up. Maybe it's the coworker from hell. See yourself loving them. See yourself hugging them. Why? Because God loves them. How? The Holy Spirit. How will I love them? The Holy Spirit. How will I share my faith, the Holy Spirit? How will I walk into hospital rooms with sick people? How will I walk into, into, into rooms with families that are broken and hurting because they're in a very desperate situation? How? The Holy Ghost. Mary said to the angel, how will I know that this is from you, the Holy Spirit? And how will I bring this child forth, Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit. That's how. Come on, close your eyes, dream. Just dream for a little bit. See, see the person that God wants you to become, not the person you are right now. That person is dying tonight, amen? Come on, tonight you're being reborn. As a matter of fact, let's all get born again tonight. Let's all stand to our feet. Let's just get saved tonight, all of us. You guys want to do that real quick, honestly? Let's just give our life to Jesus for real tonight, all of us, like for real, and say, Jesus, you know what, after tonight, that's it. I'm breaking up with me. Like, like, this relationship with me sucks anyways. I mean, I'm always, like, 
putting myself down. I'm always devaluing myself. I'm always doubting me. I'm always afraid of me. I'm like, let's just break up with that person. Amen? Seriously, can we just break up tonight? Yeah? But don't break up to make up. Come on, just lift your hands as, as a sign of surrender to God. And just repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I surrender. I give up. I give up who I am for who you are. I give up my name for your name, Jesus. I surrender my mind, my will, my emotions. Jesus, save me. Save my soul. Forgive me of all my sins. Tonight, I'm being baptized with the Holy Spirit. A fresh baptism. I'm also rededicating my life to you, Jesus. My life is not mine. It's yours. Tonight, I surrender it. All of it. All of me for all of you. Jesus, I welcome your spirit of truth. Holy Spirit, I welcome you in my life. Lead me. Guide me. Speak to me. Convict me. Holy Spirit, comfort me. Jesus, tonight is a new night a new beginning a fresh start with you Jesus tonight I am born again filled with your Holy Spirit full of life and I'm ready say it I'm ready say it I am ready to step in to your holy purposes regardless of what I feel, what I know, what I think. Tonight, I surrender and I yield to the governing of your word for my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Now give the Lord a big hand clap of praise and say, yeah. Come on.
prophesy, we prophesy the liars. Oh. Turn to fire, testifying of the sun. said to me, Elevate Church will have a year of action. That means that as you go into action, just think about as you're active in the things of God, I could only fathom what God wants to do in your life. I mean, I, Chris, where are you, Chris? Chris, come here. I, I, I'm telling you. I can only fathom. I can, I mean, look, Carlos, just think about, just just, just give, just give God permission for Him to dream through you. I, I mean, some of you, you, you struggle with dreaming. I get it. That's because you're dreaming. I, I, I double dog dare you to ask God, "Hey, Lord, go for it. Just dream through me. What the heck? I got nothing good happening in my life right now. Might as well just, just like, okay, what do you want?" And then be careful what you what you pray for. Because then he'll just drop something on you that'll just wreck your hair. And if you have none, you'll grow new hair. I mean, it'll just, God just works in like amazing ways. He does. You think I wanted to open in school in Oaxaca, Mexico? I was fine. Do you think I wanted to leave my comfort of where I was at. I was loved where I come from. I was blessed. I was, I was favored. And then God said, let's go. I want you to open a church. In the most jacked up neighborhood in Santa Clarita. That's why no pastors want to open a new, a new home. You're not called to everything. You're called to one thing. Find the one thing. What's the one thing you were called by God to do? What, what is it? I don't know. Then you know what? Here's my other part of my, you can pause right here. You can stand right here. We're going to be, I, I'm going to talk to you right now. But. How do, how do I do this? What do you, what do you, so I, I got you. Sit down for a second. What do I do quickly? Because we're still, we're perfect time. We're almost done. You can sit on my chair too. It's so anointed right there. You can just. <laughs> what, what do I do? How do I do this? What do I do? Because I know that when you hear my testimony, you think, I can't do what Mauricio does. And you know what? You're right. Stand on your feet. Yeah. Love your hair, man. You know why? And this is for everyone. Because it must be developed. If not, you'll force it. See, the power is never given to someone who is hungry for power. The power is given 
to someone who's hungry for a relationship. The power flows through God's relationship with you. God doesn't give power. So for everyone here, it starts with relationship. That's how you develop it. Can you put my other verse on, seek me and you shall find me? I want to pray for you too. You can sit down. I want to pray for you too because God's, God's doing something in you. I don't even think you understand what he's doing. I think you, under, you know in your head that he's doing something, but no, let me tell you something. No, he's doing something in you, but, but he's going to arrest you tonight because you've been doing things your way too long and nothing wrong with that okay I've done things my way for a long time they're not to be sin they're not to be evil they're not to be wrong but but God's saying that I gave you that liberty now it's time for something for me amen isn't that cool God look how do I do this here's how ask and it will be what who's this Holy Spirit ask Holy Spirit Look at the next thing. Seek. Knock. For anyone and everyone who asks receives. But the one who seeks finds. It didn't say the one who learns. See, because relationship will always trump knowledge. Because if it was only knowledge, then China wouldn't be having revival. Because they had no Bible. Yet they had revival. They had Holy Spirit. And out of that relationship with the Holy Spirit, they came alive. And to the one who knocks, the door might be open. No, it will be open. It's... it's God's an active guy. He's progressive. No, it's going to, all you got to do is not, but see, we don't want to knock and we don't want to see, but we want it all. God's like, no, pursue me. Pursue me. And so how do I do that, Pastor? What do you, how do you develop that? Just throw my points up there. Number one, I sit with him. You know what you do? This is how I did many years ago, okay? Literally, can, can you give me two chairs up here, please? Like fast, two guys can help him out. Can you help him out, Raul? Okay, you give him a chair. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, right there, up there. It's good. That's good. I dare you to do this. Because this is what I did. I know it looks stupid, but hey, you know what? Stupid worked. <laughs> because you have to do something physical in order to see something spiritual. Ever say sit. sit? Just sit with the Holy Spirit. I did this. I've been saved for 21 years. This is how I had. This is how I, it had to work for me because I'm such a, a, a application person. Like for me, I have to have handles. So I was like, okay, sit. Holy Spirit sits, and then I envision Holy Spirit. What's He look like to you? None of your business. That's between me and Him. And and I would just sit there. Here's why I say sit because you're like, well, that's stupid. That's so simple. No, it's not. See, because you have to learn how to invite presence into your house. Presence doesn't just walk in. Presence must be invited. So I invite him to sit. Sit with me. And then I see him there. Number two, then I bring things about my life to his attention. Good things, bad things, sinful things, hateful things, angry things. You know why? Because he's known as the comforter. He's known as the counselor. He's known as the standby. He's known as wisdom. And so I just begin to bring things about my life to the Holy Spirit. I'm angry right now. And I can literally hear, like, why are you angry? You know why I'm angry. I don't need to tell you why. You know why. You know all things. And I hear things like this. That's why we're in relationship, because I want to hear why from you. Okay. Well, my kids are driving me nuts. <laughs> and 
not pointing at any of them. And then I'll hear a voice. I love you, Mauricio. See, while you feel stupid and condemned, God just looks at me and says, that's my kid. Number three, I open my Bible and I ask him, where would you like me to read? I've been doing this for years. I still do this. And it's funny. I don't know why. Maybe, maybe God is so theme, like he's a theme God. Because he always gave me three verses, like three chapters or three verses. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three. There's something about that number three, right? And he'll give me three. And I write down the three chapters. And as I write those down, I say, okay, God, I, I got those number four. I begin to read, and then I begin to read the Bible to seek an answer, a solution, direction, or just be in His presence. If today's message impacted you in any way, and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below, and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.